It is October 6, 2023. It's 8.35 a.m. Illinois time. I just got through Iowa. I'm in Illinois on the highway. And <clears throat> I'm sick still. I've been trying to get myself better. I've been drinking emergency. I've been driving 12, but I've still been driving 12 hours a day. So I left at seven. So between seven and eight p.m. tonight, I will <clears throat> sleep again, but I've been outfitted my car where I black out all the windows and sleep in the back. And it's been getting down to like, I don't know, 30, 30 degrees out here. Which isn't too bad, I like the cold, but I can't kick kick it. I can't kick the sickness. But I thought this would be a good, uh, simple, easy example to talk to you about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Do you have a moment to talk about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? And I'm saying that in a funny and ironic way, but this really is going to be a video about God, satanic activity on a very rudimentary, very basic level. And then, since I'm assuming the people that tune into this are intelligent individuals, or at least suffer from the Dunning-Kruger effect, you can extrapolate that data outward and get a better understanding of, um, or be a little bit more sympathetic towards people with um, a religious mindset. Uh, what do I wanna do? Do I wanna define some terms and do some personal experiences for us, talk about the cold? Let's talk about the cold first. <clears throat> okay. We'll talk about sin, repenting, my sickness, my trip. So, <clears throat> one of my aims in life, one of the targets that I go for, is to be healthy. I aim to be healthy. I set my life up in a direction where I'm healthy. Now, health is not black and white, it's shades of gray, because you can't be perfectly healthy, although Brian Johnson is trying to, to see if we can. But you can practice uh, life regimens, protocols, that for the most part will help you to be healthier we're at your realistic, healthy level. If the aim is health, then by the translation of sin, when you miss being healthy, when you miss the target, you have sinned, you've missed the target. And there will be natural consequences set up within the system of the universe that you have to, you can't escape from. In order to get back on course, to re-aim for the target of health. So, I'm sick because I made a health error. And I don't know, I can't pinpoint it exactly, exactly, broccoli, uh, exactly. I can't pinpoint it exactly, but I haven't been eating like I normally have. I know I should be eating better, but I wasn't eating better because uh, it was harder to eat better and I was tempted 
by the shows and the activities that I wanted to go see. So there was a temptation that got me away from the path that I should have been on of health. Same thing with my sleep hygiene. I knew that I function best when I sleep a certain amount of time when I'm rested. And instead of going to bed at an early time, I didn't want to miss some of the activities in Vegas, some of the comedy shows and the and events. So I strayed from the path of the narrow for sleeping and stayed up later. And on top of that, I had a few beers some nights, not a lot, maybe like four beers for the whole day, and I don't normally drink. So if the goal was to only put healthy things into my body, I strayed from that. Um, I'm usually pretty good with washing my hands, and you know, I'm around tens of thousands of people in Vegas touching door handles and stuff and their sicknesses and illnesses. And my immune system is not a top, top level. So I got sick. And now I'm healing up, resting, uh, you know, re removing sickness from me via tissues and what have you. So I am repenting for my sin of not staying on the narrow path of health. The reason I'm using these terms is hopefully that if you're a person that laughs at religion, and I'm not a religious person, but I do, um, religion like any system whether it's government on the local level, regional level, global level, or whatever. Just anything that there's a collection of, of uh, power, you're going to get bad actors that come in and start, start creating some issues in there. So religious is no exception to the rule. And they, they try to create rules to help you get to this to these points where if they teach you principles, like they say, hey, you need to be healthy. And the way to be healthy is to eat healthy, track your macro and micro intake from food, exercise to work out your body, hydrate your body to help flush out toxins that you your body naturally creates from the food excess uh, as it burns the, the calories in different ways. Sleep to restore and recover and build your body back up. And not doing drugs, alcohol, and putting yourself in insane, dangerous situations. Whatever. These are all, this all falls into the line of health. So, <clears throat> the idea that you can be 100% perfect on it, um, conceptually is good to have to have an image of what the perfection part of it would be although you can't obtain that you can look towards that and work towards that and it's okay to fall short into sin but you get back on track and you repent for the sins that helps you get back on track so if perfect health and perfect strategies and the perfect way that we do it conceptually within the world is woven into the fabric somewhere. What if that unknown, like we know that you have to do all that stuff in a particular order and a particular amount of time with other variables at some point to get the closest you can to perfect health. And we imagine that there's a perfect health. If you call that perfect health the truth of health, could you see that if that was woven into the fabric in some way, how that could be considered God, God's plan? And then 
since that's a conceptual individual, what would look that look like for a human to follow that path? And then Jesus was the idea that what would it look like to walk the perfect path of health in the world? And then Jesus comes so people can, can, can emulate his strategies and techniques. Like if you ever watched any videos of Arnold Schwarzenegger, he talks about how he used to put photos on his wall of men that were in really good shape and exercise and had big muscles and stuff because he was trying to look at them and change his body to emulate and figure out what path it took. So he had an aim and he would eat and work out and stuff and if he didn't start to get closer to what they looked like, he knew that he was off track. He knew that he was sinning and then he had to repent by getting on track for the amount of time that it took to get him back on aim so that he could start looking closer to those images again. When you try to take a shortcut or you fall victim to the temptations, such as, and in this one it's very simple ones, you are pretending that if you don't sleep right or if you don't eat right or if you don't hydrate properly and do all these things you are pretending you can you could be pretending that health is not you know maybe health isn't a priority for you but the idea is if you have a loving caring life and you love yourself your friends your family and the life that you've set all up You'd want to enjoy it to the best of your ability for the longest period of time within the world in the realm of this physical plane that we're currently on. So health would become a priority. If you're living in a negative place where you hate things and you don't have friends and you're being robbed, stolen from, escaping murders, stressed out, have diseases or hooked on drugs, and doing a bunch of negative things, so you've given up on the idea, the conceptual structure of being content and then being able to jump from content. So if you're content and you're kind of in the middle, it's easier to get up to happiness and enjoy and then back down to content. But if you're sad and miserable, when you hop up, you're just kind of getting to contentness and you can't get to the happiness and joy. And that's what you're experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis. It would be pretty easy to never experience what people call like, you know, a holy type spirit. When when you're really in a good, happy place, when you can look out into the world and all you see, and, and, and it's it's a resource. But when people are like moved to tears by beauty, it's because they you can get yourself to a place where you're looking out. And you're just seeing everything as beautiful. And, and when that happens, it's overwhelming. It becomes overwhelming to you as an individual. It's no different than when everything just falls to absolute shit garbage and you can't figure out a way to even get back to... It, it feels like it's going to last forever. You might cry because you are sad, frustrated, and it's just like nothing's ever working out. There's that old story of the ring inside. It says, this too shall pass. So if something's bad happening to you, you got to remember that it's going to be over. But if something's good happening to you as well, you got to remember that eventually it'll be over. This too shall pass. Now, if... You want to look at the at the world that there's a natural order woven into the fabric that if you follow some universal laws that are predetermined that we don't have any say over and by following those laws you end up being healthy which you also label as a positive attribute being healthy content happy and joyous 
points are all different, but the, the point of contentment is where you can jump to being enjoyment and happy easier than if you are here. You have to make the leap to content and then whatever. That would seem like a very positive, spiritual, godly-like um, endeavor to be on. Whereas, if you give up on everything, including health, and you become sad, and you don't believe in those things, then you've given into the earthly, the earthly pragmatic ability. Like they're, they're just the pragmatism of today's today, and this is this, and. Uh, just a negative mindset with no goals and whatever happens to me happens to me so if I'm fat I'm just fat it has nothing to do with me if I'm sick it's just because I got sick and I, there's no way I can avoid it you get sick sometimes um, or I'm unhealthy I got X Y or Z there was nothing I could do about it that could be determined and thought of as um, so when Beelzebub or, or Satan or whatever you want to call the fallen angel it, the, the term here fell to earth was given you know rather than be second in command in heaven chose to be first command on earth and fell so if you want to simply live in the earthly realm without what I just discussed as you know as this this I, this uneffable uh, unexplainable thing that's woven into the fabric around you. you just want to simply say that's grass it's green no one knows why you know and not investigate any further if you're like I got sick it, you just get sick sometimes there's no way to avoid it could you see how we could label that as satanic? After all the other the, the, all the other footwork that I that I laid down for you, that not recognizing the the goals, but furthermore, when you do recognize the goal, choosing to not aim for them and continuously sinning and never repenting for your sins, meaning getting back on track, would be living a satanic lifestyle. I'm not suggesting that getting sick is evil and being healthy is good in this particular scenario, although we could extrapolate some things where if you're knowingly running around um, getting people sick on purpose or spreading negativity or sabotaging other people's health when they have a goal of health um, there is an argument to be said for that to be evil um, I, don't, I don't really want to stray into that that area. So, next on the menu, let's define some terms that I didn't, I didn't to, to think. Because I'm going to get to the philosophy, and I'm going to give you a little experiment to do in your life, just to see. So, let's define three three terms here, because three is the magic number, the rule of the three: atheism agnosticism and theism which I believe these three terms are highly misunderstood and deterministic in their nature and so the precision in which we use language and understand language is the precision in which we can express ourselves, our emotions and understanding and make our aims and our goals for those targets more precise 
when we have a language to internal to internalize it and then for some people uh, an emotion that they can attach to that language they can experience it on a uh, an emotional level which they might understand better so was I supposed to take that exit oh well so no, I think I got like 100, 100 miles to go on this so the term, let's 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 do theism first. So the term theism is the belief that there is a uh, a god, or the belief that there is a supernatural uh, guidance, for lack of a, a better term within the in the world whether that guidance uh is no longer here it was a clockwork guidance or it's currently here and they they can move some things around a theist believes that there is uh, a god belief is a very important word we're going to define that afterwards so there's also ag um, agnostic or agnosticism, agnosticism, or being agnostic. So agnostic is uh, a very dangerous word, I guess I should say. Uh, it's the it's the word that would mean I'm not sure if I believe in God or not. And the reason I find that dangerous is um, a person that labels himself agnostic and internalizes that without the belief system is telling me that there's certain topics about themselves, knowing thyself, that... they either don't want to work on or don't want to share so if you're calling yourself an agnostic I would hope that it was a short term I, I would hope that it's a short term label that you're putting on yourself and that you're working diligently to figure out your belief system honestly and openly with yourself and determine whether you believe in a God or you don't believe in a God. Uh, it, it's not saying that there that a God exists or doesn't exist. It's not a proof of. It's, a, it's your belief system. So people believe in many things that aren't true and people don't believe in many things that that are true it goes both ways but to have something in your life that you are not sure how you believe uh, it, it would be a major priority to myself to figure out why I didn't know myself well enough to figure out what I believed and then lastly the term atheist is someone who does not believe in God. You do not believe. So, you're probably asking yourself at this point, self, where does Dave Wright fall into this category? So hopefully, you, you know where you fall. If not, that would be a good project to work on. Figure out if you believe in God, don't believe in God. And please, think about it until you are no longer agnostic. If, if you're agnostic then um, really get to know yourself because you should figure these things out. I am an atheist. When I do the proof and the work and the acknowledgement of the universe science, philosophy, and such I just 
in my gut, in my heart, in my mind, when I go all the way through the end, uh, I just, I, I don't believe in the existence of God. It's my belief. However, my belief that there is or isn't a God has nothing to do whether or not a God exists or doesn't exist. It's simply my personal belief. And if I don't believe in God, and there is a God, and I found out that there was a God, and I got proof, I don't know what I would need for proof to make the leap over into belief. But there is, I also do know that if, if there was new evidence presented that I would make the, the leap from non-belief to belief. And why this is important to me, as well as for any other atheist that has gone through the process, is that The, your belief in something is, a deter, is deterministic. Meaning if I'm using logic and evidence to come to this conclusion of my belief, and in the end of that belief system, I come to the fact that I don't believe. Okay? So I, I don't believe in God. But if there was new evidence presented to me in the future that I would believe in God. And I'm not making an existence claim on the existence of God. And there's pretty much two answers. The 50-50 chance. One, that there is a God. And two, that there isn't a God. <coughs> Then, by def the, the, default, the default idea of not believing, I could be wrong. Meaning, I don't believe in their God, but there could be a God. Meaning, so I could be incorrect in, in, in my thought process and the evidence and the information I look for. Vice versa, if somebody's a theist and they believe... Um, that's going to be kind of more of a null hypothesis because they already have faith that there is a God, so there would probably be no amount of evidence to uh, turn them around to, to disbelief because uh, um, there just isn't a way to prove that there isn't because even on the scientific way that I look at it, God is always the horizon. He's uh, the ultimate truth. Where as we collect data and experience and look at the universe, what is in the universe is the science. It was created by evolution over long periods of time, but it's but but that evolution happens and no one knows why. So there's a gap there. Can we call that gap God? And people say, well, now you're just playing the, the gap of the gods. And it's like, okay, so what other term do you call the fact that there's definitely something in the background holding physics together that we can't explain, see, touch, or, or whatever. There's definitely an essence inside uh, an egg and a sperm that we can't replicate. There's an essence inside a seed that if you cut it up and put it back together, it won't grow. So there is a there is a, a another power that we can't weigh, we can't see, we can't taste, we can't hear. We can't use any of our basic basic senses to 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 replicate. So I says to myself, self, you don't believe in God. You're an atheist. But that's a deterministic mindset, and 
I, Dave Wright, I believe in free will. So, I said, well, just because your current belief system is that you don't believe in God, it doesn't mean that you don't have the free will to choose to believe in God. So I started an experiment about, I would say two, three, maybe four years ago now, where I said, I'm going to live my life in a manner in which God exists. And the way that I did this is, you know, I'm not wishing and praying and sitting around doing nothing uh, like God is a genie granting wishes to people. And I'm not living in fear of God like he's going to smite down and punish me. Um, the framework in the punishment it is, it is what's there. So I did not take care of my health. So God, the universe, natural order, created a, a repercussion to that, a natural uh, consequence of sickness, saying, hey, if you continue down this path, you're not going to live anymore. You're going to get sicker and sicker and sicker. So turn the ship around, get back on track, don't get sick, get your immune system functioning well, and you'll be okay. So it's not out of hate for me that I'm being punished by God. It's baked into the cake because God loves me and he wants health, happiness for me. <coughs> that he gives me these signals of me being off the aim, of me sinning. So now I'm repenting for my sin and getting back on track. So when I chose to start living in a world where I believe in God, I did a couple things. One is before bed, I just give gratitude and grace for 10, 15 minutes and just say, thank you, God, for everything that I have. I mean, I have uh, two wonderful businesses. I have freedom to, to travel. I normally have my health. <laughs> um, I have my mind. I have my ability to influence people. I have a car. I have food. I have clothing. I have a roof over my head. I have a comfortable bed. I, I have everything I could ever ask for. Now, it's not that I'm not moving forward trying to create more value in the world, but I'm trying to create more value in the world, not, not obtain more riches and currencies so another biblical thing I guess it would be called but it's you know you don't don't work for riches on earth but for heaven for, for heavenly wealth and the idea of that to me is not that you get your rewards in the afterlife although that could be what happens to somebody maybe maybe this is all a simulation and I wake up and I'm in the real world and I'm getting uh, rewarded for how I acted in this this simulation but more of when you're working to create healthy happy good value in your community and you feel good about it the reward is the work that you're doing, the happiness you're providing, the, the, the goodness for, for a simple term in a, in a nice manner, bringing people together, happiness, and, and providing value to their, their life, then you still do get currency and you still have the ability to, to gather you know, more riches here. But that's not your goal. The goal is you're building heavenly and when I say heavenly I'm thinking conceptual conceptual wealth and value um, a, 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 among people the, the stuff that you can't hold but it has a lot of value to your community and to your people and the way that you know that is that you are getting uh, in most cases 
wealth back here. So yes, you can go point a gun at somebody and steal all their money and be like, well, I just got a bunch of real wealth, so I must have added some value to society by pointing the gun at somebody. And it's like, well, it also has to be spontaneous, organic, and voluntary in within the system of the aim so that you're not sinning. And so if the aim is you to be happy, then other people's aim is also to be happy. And if you have a universal preference or preference for the behavior of happiness, then pointing a gun somebody to take somebody's money is not adding value, it's removing value. You've enslaved that individual. You've stolen from them. Not only do they lose the actual currency that they have, but they lose the emotional time it takes to get over whatever happened to them in that traumatic experience, however much it affects them. And they lose the excess resources they could have done while they were healing. And then they gotta go back and work again for free basically to make up the resources that you took from them. So theft is slavery of an individual. There is really one major uh, ultimate sin or ultimate <coughs> thing. I, I don't even think there needs to be ten commandments. Just this: "Thou shalt not steal" is all you really need. I won't break it down, but I'll just say, when you murder somebody, you're stealing their entire life and everything that they would have created afterwards. So, stealing is the ultimate. Now, as I started believing in God, so you have a theory, you put you put this hypothesis into the work, that if, you know, if I drop an egg, it falls, it hits the ground and it breaks. Now you take an egg, you drop it, falls, breaks. Take another egg, drop it, falls, breaks. Take another egg, drop it, falls, breaks. You're like, okay, when you drop an egg, I haven't had an experience yet when you drop it, it doesn't fall and it doesn't break. So it seems like gravity exists, eggs are fragile to an extent. And that there's a faith and a universal belief that if I tested that a hundred times today and it happened, that I could test it a hundred times tomorrow and it happened, and I could wait a hundred years and test it a hundred times and it would happen again. So every night I go to bed, I, I say, God, or however you want to do it, I just give grace and say thank you for everything that I have, for my good friends, for, for the love, for the health, for the roof over my head, for the food, for my car, for my businesses, for my ability to speak and help people and add value to their lives, whatever it may be. I'm not wishing for stuff. I'm not saying, hey God, give me a million dollars. Give me a uh, corn fed big bitty with big titties and a big booty. I'm not wishing for stuff to a genie. I'm recognizing that there's positive stuff in my life because I'm doing positive things with my life. And I'm kind of doing a check-in. I apologize, I'm a little bit sick. I'm, I'm doing positive things with a positive check-in. Sorry. And as I do that on a day-to-day -day basis with a couple of other things, the other thing I do is I just look for positive signs. So, like, I've been gone for 30 days and I had a lot of anxiety about the, the, the trip. And I left on the 1st and the, and, the, and the festival ended one month later on the 1st and everybody's sitting outside and there's music and stuff going. And they're like, goodbye and blah, blah, blah. And I woke up the next morning and I had my first emergency for the business where... There was packages building up and it was causing issues and <coughs> I couldn't figure out a solution to it. I did take a deep breath and, and end up figuring out a solution and it worked out and I was able to handle it. But I didn't really know how I was going to get there from point A to point B. I had faith that I would figure it out. 
But when that happened, I immediately was like, oh, thank you. This problem's been running in the background, but it wasn't that big of a deal. And I didn't find out about it until the end of my journey. Meaning, like, if I found out about it on the previous Friday, I would have been, it would have been in the back of my mind, maybe, all weekend, stressing me out. And instead, I found out about it after everything was over. And I was, it was like, it couldn't have been more perfect. So I could just look at that and be like, wow, that's just a giant coincidence. I mean, it, ha it you know, and the next day was Monday, so maybe they just waited a week and they had it on their list of, to do things and they woke up Monday morning and they sent out the emails, the texts, and the phone calls. Could be. Most likely. Something like that. But also, it happened at the past. So, since I have free will and I can look at that in any manner that I want to look at it in, I'm going to choose to look at it in a manner where that's a positive thing that's happened to me and it's godly in a way that good things are happening because I've set myself up mostly for good and I have systems in place and I'm not looking at it in a way that God orchestrated or there was somebody in the background orchestrating it I looked at it in a way that my systems that I set up that I had an aim to do, that I focused on within the world of this realm was so good that it prolonged any problems for one month. And when I had this issue, I had to re reconfigure my systems or fix it and add another person, which now I have an assistant. I hired the person that helped me back in New Hampshire. I'm going to hire them as an assistant when I get back to take care of odds and ends like this for me. So, when that happened, and it wasn't during the concert, and it happened afterwards, I could have flipped out and gotten really stressed or whatever, but instead I just said, oh, thank you. The good news is this happened after all my fun. So now I, get, I'm on my, I have to change my mindset back to reality. But I, I just like gave thanks to the universe or to whatever. Because for some reason, this didn't happen on the Friday before. It didn't happen, you know, two weeks into the trip. It happened after the fact. And so I gave thanks for that. Now, if it did happen on that Sunday and the last day, on the 1st, I could still give thanks and try to solve it, and maybe I would solve it before I went. And then I could still say, okay, I had a problem during a really important day, the last day of the festival to me, but I was able to solve it, and I had the skills to do it. And then I would still say, wow, thank you for giving me a big challenge that I solved before the festival that made me realize that I can overcome obstacles so that I'm not stressed out during the festival and I can enjoy it. When, when I change my belief system that th there's a term called paranoia I'm sure everybody's heard about it's when you feel like everybody's out to get you including the universe and factors and people and then there's proanoia which is when you pretend that everybody is out to help you be your friend, wants to get to know you loves you wants your business to be successful and the universe is working together as a collective to make everything go extraordinarily well for you and you can see the world in those two ways however you choose to if you believe in your free will you can choose it either way I can tell you since I started proactively choosing to believe in God my life has gotten much better. So if you have a theory that your life will get better when you start believing in God, and you start believing in God and acting in a manner and your life gets better, then you're pretty much proving a hypothesis. And even if it's a placebo effect, it's still an effect that exists within the world. 
So if they're like, well, it's just an imaginary effect because you're believing it. Okay. Good enough for me because it's working. So if that's what it takes, then that's what it takes. Well, you're holding two contradictory beliefs at the same time. Yeah, so is everybody. Except I'm choosing to do it. And, I, and I'm and i aware and I recognize it. And, I, that it. and it's beneficial to me. It's not causing problems in my life. Such as thinking that I'm in love with somebody who's abusive to me. That's holding two contradictory statements in your head that brings negativity to your life. I'm not doing that. I'm doing the exact opposite. So I, I would suggest, if you like, to one, sit down and figure out what your current belief system is and why. And two... Maybe do an experiment where is if, if you don't believe, to start believing in pro-anoia and some positive mindsets and see where your life goes and how it changes. Give yourself some aims to shoot for and recognize that if you miss it, that a sin is not permanent. It's not a scarlet letter. The beauty of Christianity, especially Orthodox Christianity, is the whole point of repentance is that you have to repent as long as it takes to get back on track. The problem with stuff like Catholicism that's been corrupted by by humans for for you know corrupt evil humans is they're like, well, I'm in power, so go say 20 Hail Marys and you'll be better. You no longer sin. It's like, no, no, no. When you're off track have to repent as long as it takes to get back on track. There's no magic words that somebody can give you. It's you and God. The connection is you and the universe. It's you and the natural consequences. You're in this together. It's like um, when I was in Zion National Park, I kept saying this over and over and over again. I'd be walking super slow behind somebody that was walking super, super slow. And they would turn around and finally see me because they were just unaware because they were so busy just trying to walk because they're having they're just not healthy and they're just having difficulties walking because they don't take care of themselves and they're unaware because they have to put so much effort into walking that they don't have time to even be able to recognize their surroundings or maybe they're on pharmaceutical drugs or something I don't know and time and time again people would turn around and oh, oh, oh I'm sorry uh, you're so patient. And I would say, yes, thank you. Patience is a practice. And the point or the idea behind patience being a practice and not uh, something that you acquire and keep, it's that you have to be in situations that are frustrating and make you slow down time and time again in order to practice being patient. So if you can always go, 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 move, 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 and everything's out of your way, and you've never had, you know, you're never stuck behind somebody that's going slow like I am right now, or walking slow, or had to wait on line for a long time, or wait for a phone call, and then they pick up and you're like, oh, thanks for waiting. They're like, oh, no problem, how are you doing today? And they're like, oh, you're in a good mood for waiting two hours. And you're like, well, patience is a practice, and I had to make this phone call, so, there's no reason to get upset when it has to be done one way or another. Having that mindset makes everything a lot smoother. That's just one one little example there. And I'm sure you can find many more in your life. So, just to end this, you're going to make mistakes. It's okay. You're going to sin, which means you're going to move away from the truth. Hopefully they're accidental. Accidental meaning... So, like, I didn't accidentally stay up and watch a comedy thing. But there was no morality to that. So I stayed up because I wanted to see more comedy. And I knew that I was sinning and that I was borrowing from my sleep hygiene that I was going to have to repent for it and get it back on track as far as health. 
it wasn't a conflict between good or evil. So I chose to come off track and repent back. I There's a different type, a hardcore sin, where, you know, thou shall not steal, or it, you steal from somebody. That's different. You know that that thing is wrong. And you sin by doing it anyways, and you know that you're hurting the other person and taking them off track. So not only are you sinning for yourself, you're sinning for that other person. Meaning you, you're, you're not supposed to be doing that, and now they have, now they're off track because they were counting on that money that put them on track, or they were counting on not having to heal up from being abused from you physically, which is theft of time for healing and emotional trauma. So that is when the sins become evil. So you don't want to be sinning in that manner. And you never, you never want to. You want to work to your utmost ability to get yourself in a mindset that you're never sinning via evil. Your sins should be like little white sins. And the purpose of them is that they'll have a natural consequence. And when you have that natural consequence, you get back on track. And some of those consequences will be immediate. Some of those consequences will be long term. Some of those consequences will be affected from others. Meaning if you're trapped in within a system and of others and you're eating poor food because you're a child trapped in a family, for example, for, um, uh, example and you get overweight and get sickly, then your family is sinning and you're being affected by the sin, but even though you're sinning, you're still living in um, the naive mindset of a child, but that can be extrapolated outward where there's a system that you're been born into in the society that's doing and making and acting in negative ways, but in the current set, you can't get out of. So the society around you is sinning and you can't escape the social the social sins. So you can get back on track as far as you can on your own, but you can't get to some of the most positive, perfect, on target situations that you want to because uh, there's evil people maybe with guns that are forcing you not to go in that particular direction. And in that case, um, you want to keep pushing to try to get towards the perfect aim, towards the positive and, and good aim. But but evil stopping you from getting to good is 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 nothing is nothing new. So that got a little too abstract. But I hope that you find some value in this. I'm sure there'll be lots of haters in the comments that are triggered because they'll be like, well, if you just if you just call science God, then of course God, but these words mean different things, and it's like, no, everybody's not the same. Shed your egalitarianism. People experience